Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another VITA Learning Webinar. Uh, today, we are featuring uh, Dr. Julian Conejo, and we are going to go over the uh, dentalist patient in the digital uh, era. This is uh, going to be a very unique uh, program in the sense that um, Dr. Conejo comes from UPenn. He is a, um, a, a serious technician in his own right as well as a, uh, a dentist, and he's involved with a lot of digital um, dentistry for Crown and Bridge, for other prosthetics, as well as digital dentures. So this is kind of be a mix for, uh, and geared more for everyone, clinical and laboratory, uh, to understand kind of the workflow, wh whichever direction you're coming from. So just a couple things uh, before we get going with the actual presentation. Uh, I want to let everyone know that your phone is on mute. So during the meeting, if you have a question, please go to the question box on that upper right-hand corner of your desktop. There should be a panel, and under that there is a uh, question box. So type in your questions, and then we will um, answer these at the end of the program uh, after the presentation. Okay, uh, we will be recording the webinar. So if you missed something or you want to revisit it, you can join us on the Vita YouTube channel, the Vita North America, uh, the LinkedIn, the Instagram, Facebook as well. All of these recordings, uh, remote webinars are recorded and they're posted. Give us a couple of days and then we will uh, have that on our websites and that you can revisit if you'd like. So we've got uh, Dr. Julian Canejo. How are you doing, Dr. Canejo? Wave to the audience, if you don't mind. Yes, hello, everyone. I'm doing great, and uh, thanks for having me one more time, Jim. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you got it, of course. Uh, we're very grateful to have Dr. Canejo uh, be part of the team to join us on these remote webinars. Uh, he's done many in the past for us. Uh, he lectures everywhere, internationally, um, works at UPenn, as I mentioned earlier. So he has a lot of insight into the newest technology and the best practices, if you will, regardless whether you're a dentist and or a laboratory. Um, so Dr. Caneo uh, obtained his uh, DDS from the Universidad Latina, Costa Rica in 2005. He then completed training as a prosthodontist at the, uh, in Mexico in 2008. He's a visiting scholar at the Department of Preventive, Preventative and Restorative Sciences, uh, Sciences, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia, UPenn. Uh, he practices clinical, clinical dentistry and conducts extensive research at UPenn. And he's currently the uh, uh, director uh, of the clinical CAD CAM at UPenn. Uh, he does a lot of research, experience, uh, experimentation, studies. You, he's got Buku articles. If you're interested in, in learning a lot more from Dr. Conejo and the team at UPenn, uh, he's got, I don't know, what do you got, 40, 50 articles, studies? Probably more, yeah. Dr. Conejo. Around there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just just unbelievable, a lot of different uh, articles that you can look up with Dr. Conejo. So uh, please do that. I will let Dr. Conejo take it over for now. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Conejo. Thank you again, Jim. So uh, welcome again, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me always to have the time to share about my passion, which is uh, digital prosthodontics and uh, today we're going to talk about a very exciting topic which is the uh, dentalist patient in this new digital dentistry era and uh, something that doesn't makes me feel very proud of uh, my profession actually and my specialty is that the level of edentulism is not uh, reducing but it's growing and growing so uh, many of our preventive uh, uh, concepts and, and techniques and are not being implemented uh, in the best ways and we're facing more and more uh, dentalist patients and I think it's our uh, duty to 
be updated with the, the best uh, solutions, as Jim was saying, um, to treat uh, this important group of, of people. Okay, so um, I would like to uh, get started and if there's any, any questions, uh, please feel free to type them in and uh, we will have a, a period at the end where Jim can read the questions and we can have a, a nice interactive uh, discussion about the topic. As Jim was mentioning, I've been here at the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine for six years already. I have the privilege to work with uh, Professor Marcus Blatz, who is our chairman, and um, he's been focused on uh, digital dentistry for many, many years. And uh, we, we partner uh, with Vida North America with the, in different topics, whether it's uh, uh, ceramic materials or, or uh, denture materials. And, and research as well. So um, we will uh, show a few of the concepts that uh, we we implement and we we use regarding to the edentulous patients today. So we're going to talk about uh, the digital clone, edentulism. I would like to present you a very new uh, in vitro study. I think you will uh, like to see these uh, results and conclusions that we have. But I I would like to give a uh, uh, a, a big picture, an overview of, of the edentulism in uh, digital dentistry because we might have uh, 20 years using uh, CEREC or Chairside CAD CAM systems or in the lab for fixed prosthodontics, but the um, edentulous patient, I think it's a great area within this uh, digital dentistry environment because we basically don't have those uh, landmarks or those references that are so important and so easy to work with when we're in the fixed cross world. Okay, so that's why we've also been working and, and publishing on the digital clone and it's basically how we gather these different layers of information together that always starts with the prosthetic planning and then we move to the implant planning whether, wherever that's a proper indication for that patient. So uh, that's part of the, the topics that I would like to discuss with everyone here today. Um, as we know, um, in 2021, I think that uh, every clinician should be, if not already having a last generation intraoral scanner, being looking to be able to jump into this because that's the way we do dentistry and that's what the way we will be working uh, for the next uh, coming years. Okay. Um, nowadays, uh, we don't do only chair side CAD CAM dentistry or in house where we scan, design, and mill the restorations. But nowadays, we've been working more and more in this uh, connect digital workflow where, as a clinician, I can connect with the uh, a uh, dental laboratory that has the ability to uh, design these uh, more extensive cases for edentulous patients and provide me as a clinician with uh, maybe trying restorations and final prosthesis, whether they are tissue supported or uh, implant supported restorations. Nowadays, it's more frequent that we share uh, our files with uh, milling centers for the fabrication of uh, frameworks or uh, custom titanium abutments as well. So um, I think that the intraoral scanner is a uh, very valuable or the most valuable tool for the clinician nowadays. And with that, we can uh, start partnering with multiple uh, labs or milling centers, as I explained before. It's very important to understand the development of the intraoral scanners that we have nowadays because now we are able to scan full large cases for both uh, edentulous patients because these newer technologies with uh, confocal microscopy like the CEREC uh, prime scan, for example, or the TRIOS uh, tree shape uh, makes the intraoral scanning for soft tissues very, very easy and this was not something we could do uh, a few years ago so there's a difference if you have a generation of scanner maybe one or two generations old um, i would recommend to take a look to what's new there because uh, the features are are really positive and now we can not only scan for fixed restorations but also for this type of um, edentulous patients when you are receiving a scan from a clinician or if you're doing that scan we want to make sure that it's a clean digital impression. So starting with the fixed approach, we would like to use linear 
scanning patterns. We want to make sure that all the information is clean and then we don't over scan because when we get too excited and scan and scan and scan, the file is going to be very heavy and that sometimes it's not the best to work in the softwares. So having that balance between the quality of the information we take and uh, keeping the file as, um, let's say, uh, light as possible or small as possible is something uh, important always to consider. So you'll see this, it's very traditional, basic uh, full art scanning of a full art with teeth. But today I would like to focus on the edentulous patient, okay? This is just a basic example of one of our latest publications on the digital clone, how we start scanning every case, then we take pre-op pre photos as well to merge these photos with the digital design and come up with a wax, okay? The same approach we would like to use when we have a dental patients, only we need to do some small modifications to be able to put these layers together. Once we've done a prosthetic a digital wax up, then we can include the DICOM file from the CBCT, and then we have all the layers. We have the face of the patient, we have the pre-op STL of the initial situation, we have the STL of the digital wax up, and we have the DICOM file where I can see the uh, hard structures, uh, the amount of bone, the anatomical structures that we need to respect. And I think that this should be the standard of care in 2021 where we're thinking to treat an edentulous patient as well. So here I have another uh, reality, right? Here I don't have the references that I was just showing you where I have upper teeth, lower teeth, and I can take a vocal scan and everything is very easy. Here I can scan the full uh, upper jaw, the soft tissues, the tuberosities, the the palate, the uh, ruga, the uh, palatal suture. Um, then I can scan the lower arch with proper uh, tongue retraction and get all the way back to the retromolar pad without a problem. But my problem here is that I might not have something to correlate the maxilla and the mandible, right? And this is many times where many clinicians or, or sometimes the lab as well might be a little hesitant on how to proceed. So um, our recommendation, it's always a very good idea to um, evaluate the prosthesis that the patient has already and don't discard them completely. They can be uh, viewed as a tool for maxillomandibular uh, record taking, okay? So what we do here is basically that we can place these uh, radiopaque markers to the existing dentures of the patient. Let's say this patient is looking to transition to a new set of dentures, to let's say a lower over denture with two implants on the canines because the, uh, the retention and, and the uh, the quality of, of, of chewing and quality of life in general of the lower denture is not not good then we can use this to start planning so here uh, what we do is that we place these radiopaque markers to the existing dentures that we know they are not ideal but they can still be very helpful so you see here in the intraoral scan i'm scanning both dentures from the outside but also from the intaglio surface, okay? This is done with a CEREC prime scan, and I'm scanning these uh, radiopaque markers. These ones are uh, with stickers, but you could just make some holes and add some gutta percha, uh, whatever you want to use, just want to make sure that we have them distributed properly in all the different surfaces of the dentures and that they are radio opaque, okay? So then we're going to also make the CBCT with the dentures in position okay so with this workflow we can merge everything together and we can incorporate the stl file of the dentures that have the same references as the dicom file and then that's what you see on the image on the right side where we have the ability to start treatment planning we have the ability as well to check the restorative space 
And those are very important aspects to try to avoid having complications later on when we are designing and fabricating the final prosthesis. The more time we invest here together, uh, communicating between the lab and the clinician and treatment planning, the less time we are going to be um, investing or suffering at the end, trying to fit something where we don't have enough space or the implant was not perfectly uh, positioned as well. Okay, so remember, don't discard the initial dentures, use the markers, and then take a, a buccal scan with the dentures in position, and that way we can articulate the case and continue moving forward, okay? Uh, other aspect that it's very important when we are thinking to create new digital dentures or over dentures or even transition these patients to a full large fixed prosthesis is visualizing the type of a dentulous patient that we are going to be treating because it's not the same if uh, there's a 35 year old patient with rampant caries and teeth needs to be extracted and maybe uh, the restorative space is much more limited. If I have maybe an 80-year-old patient having wearing complete dentures for over 30 years, okay? As you see, that would be the photo on the right um, and the other situation with the photo on the left, there's less restorative space. So for some patients, maybe a hybrid restoration with acrylic teeth and a titanium framework might not be the best situation because we won't be able to fit that framework there with enough space for the acrylic and the teeth and that will lead to teeth uh, fracturing or debonding from that framework okay so it's important to categorize the patient based on the amount of um, reabsorption so i had the honor to learn from dr elgin and dr and was the uh creator of the Vita uh, Physiotin's teeth. Um, I had a, uh, the, the honor to take his course uh, probably around 11 or 10 years ago in Europe. Uh, Dr. End uh, designed the, the Vita Physiotin's teeth. And um, it's a great tooth, uh, very high quality, a lot of uh, detail on it, and very high aesthetics. And uh, as a prosthodontist, I've been doing conventional dentures, analog dentures for, for many years now. And um, when I see all the steps that I need to do, I feel that if my patient loses the denture or the denture falls while the patient is cleaning it and breaks, I need to basically start all over again. So let's review very quickly the uh, complete denture protocol from the analog perspective meaning that in the first appointment, I would need to create preliminary uh, impressions, most likely with alginate, and we can use uh, a sad trace or any type of stock tray and, and adapt it to get us as much information as possible. Then in the lab, we will need to create these um, custom trays for my definitive or final impressions. Uh, most likely I use uh, PVS in Impression material in different consistencies with the individual trays to try to get as much uh, information that I can. And then, of course, the, the third appointment will come where we have the base plates fabricated and the wax rims to determine the lip support, the incisal edge position, the vertical dimension of occlusion, the centric relation uh, registration, and determining the size of the tooth and the color to be able to go back to the lab and start uh, setting up the teeth for another appointment. This would be the fourth appointment where we go with the aesthetic try-in, and then we will also evaluate the occlusion. And as a prosthodontist, you will say, yes, I understand occlusion very well. And in this fourth appointment, I'm gonna evaluate all the details of the occlusion and the contact points. But sometimes it's not that easy because the patient is not really uh, clear what movements they need to do and maybe some of the teeth move in these uh, trying so i never consider this being that practical right in the theory you understand that's what you got to do but in the practice it's not so simple right as just putting some bullets on this slide here and then we will go ahead and and deliver the dentures and then try to alleviate as much as possible the pressure points and 
verify the occlusion again. So you finish grinding the occlusal surface of the teeth. And that was something that I, I didn't, let's say, enjoyed much with working with analog workflows on complete dentures. Okay, so we started working with uh, digital dentures a few years ago. And um, the first, um, let's say, prototypes or cases that we were treating were basically from milled uh, acrylic uh, discs for the bases and milled uh, acrylic teeth for the white part of the denture, for the teeth, right? Uh, in many situations, we had a milled uh, horseshoe where all the teeth were uh, linked together. And we saw that the aesthetics and the individualization of those uh, types of designs were, were not the best, were not ideal, okay? Uh, and then, as we've all seen how the uh, digital dentistry um, industry has been moving more and more into 3D printed uh, solutions, I think that the dental station is uh, a great group to get benefited with the new uh, materials that we can 3D print and this can also reduce the cost in the production. But we really feel that the uh, the, uh, the tooth part, uh, the white part, needs to have high quality, needs to have uh, detail to be able to say, what I'm doing in the digital world is actually better or as good as what I was doing in the analog world. We don't wanna start doing digital dentistry and modify our protocols just because we want to make sure that this has a benefit, whether it's the same quality but faster, same quality but uh, more affordable, or it's actually uh, more practical, less appointments, and or even better aesthetics and better functional aspect. But there needs to be a benefit from it um, to be able to have a, a real reason to move forward. So here, this is an example, right? Uh, a denture wearer uh, patient, okay? And um, we can see here moderate reabsorption, um, not that bad, right? We've seen uh, much worse cases, much more difficult cases. So what about intraoral scanning? So here we need to make sure that we have a scan pattern, that we follow um, the rich, and then we use as much as possible the existing anatomical features in the palate or in the mandible to be able to scan better. This is an example that we did a few years ago, and this is with the uh, TRIOS 3Shape3 three three intraoral scanner. I always use the, re the lip retractor, and then I start scanning from the tuberosity, going initially until I get to the midline and go to the other side of the arch. And once I have the horseshoe, then I go to the um, incisive papilla and the ruga and then go to the palatal suture and then I start like getting all the information together. On the uh, facial aspect, I will remove the obtragate, I will retract with my finger as I would do when I'm doing the border molding. And at that position, I'm going to stabilize the lip and I'm going to start scanning. Important is not go back again and keep scanning in that area if you already scan it because you are never going to get the muscle in the same position, okay? But if I capture very detailed the uh, hard palate, the stable part, these dentures have an excellent fit. So let me show you a video here. Uh, this will explain you a little bit better our uh, concept. So we start from the tuberosity, get to the midline, Okay, continue to the contralateral side, try to get to the tuberosity of the other side. Okay, and then go back. And here you will see that close to the midline, we have the incisive papilla. And look how nice the morphology there in the hard palate. And then we go down in the palatal suture. And then we continue trying to get as posterior as possible to be able to set our post down. Okay, then here I can remove the uh, obtragate and as I said, try to uh, scan as if you are doing your border molding with manual retraction up to a certain point, but not necessarily making any movements because 
the scanner will only capture static movement. So before I was always concerned about this, but because the impression is really mucostatic on the hard palate and the tuberosity, the fit of these dentures is really good as most of you have might experience it already, okay? So these are the SDL files taken from the intraoral scanner. Is every uh, intraoral scan for the lower arch perfect the first time? No, not necessarily, but it's never perfect also with the analog workflow, right? So it takes a, a learning curve, it takes time. I would practice with some stone models, making sure that we understand our linear pattern and then uh, get ready and start scanning with the patient, okay? So these are exported into STL files. And then something that for me is really uh, important is to be able to communicate with the lab where the uh, incisal edge position of the maxillary central incisors should go because we have to start planning from there, right? If we have that reference point based on the extraoral um, structures, our initial plan is going to be closer to be successful, not only on the aesthetic part, but also on the phonetical aspect as well, okay? So this is a papillometer I'm trying to measure from the sulcus where I want to set the incisal edge position, maybe at 20 millimeters in this case. But I think that these analog tools combined with the digital uh, tools, that's where we start to get a very good amount of information that will facilitate the design of the complete dentures later on. These are images that everyone has seen here, right? I'm going through a process of determining the new vertical dimension of occlusion, vertical dimension of rest position, those three millimeters of uh, free interocclusal space. And I go and I make multiple measurements until I see uh, an average. Let's say I measure the first one for the vertical dimension at rest position, 71 millimeters, second time 70, third time 69. So I will go with 70 there. I will subtract three millimeters and then I will like to capture that information at 67 and that's where we will be taking our scans okay so we got to be creative we have different ways to to do this we can use as i said before the pre-existing dentures from the patient okay um, we can um, add some acrylic or some resin if we need to re-establish and use those uh, dentures as a reference Remember that in the softwares, in the lab, we can always do manual correlation, okay? So as a clinician, you might want to modify your protocol a little bit, and maybe have a file where you have just the upper arch and export as an STL, have another file as a lower arch and export it, and separately you will scan whatever device you're using, if it's the pre-existing dentures, and then in the lab software, it's easier to correlate, but what you want to have is clean images, clean uh, files, so that correlation is as much precise as possible. So nowadays we uh, don't have to mill this from a wax uh, disk as we, we did a few years ago. Now we can print this very easily, so we can skip the wax drying appointment. This is basically a two-in-one. We're doing both the uh, wax frame appointment and the trying in only one appointment. So when we have these uh, trial dentures, whether they're printed or milled in wax, we can modify them, but I feel that they are even easier to, to check, to, to, to adapt when we have separate teeth on the wax frame, okay? And here, if you see that uh, you're not 100% um, happy with, with the, uh, suction that you're obtaining, you can always take some um, PVS impression material and reline them and then the lab or you can scan the intaglio as well and then that will give you a, even a better fit, okay? So um, that was how we started, as I said before, with meal teeth and uh, meal bases, okay? And uh, Vita has uh, different uh, solutions. So we start with the scanning, uh, before was only the models, now we're moving to scanning directly intraorally. 
But um, now um, with the uh, Vita Vionic Vigo Denture Teeth, we have the ability of combining, I would say, the best of both worlds because we can meal and um, fabricate a very good and dense uh, base, or we can 3D print it as well while using individual uh, stock teeth, okay, that have the geometry on the software library. So to be able to use the Vita Vigo Bionic um, teeth libraries, you need to use the uh, Three Shape software or the Exocat software. You can download those libraries and then you will order and buy the corresponding teeth that you selected in the software, okay? So we can have not only um, a milled base or printed base that it's uh, affordable, but also keep the quality on the surface and, and the quality on the uh, texture of the teeth. So uh, this would be uh, a two piece, right? We'll have a separate tooth to the base that then will be bonded. And for this, we will need to use the Vita Vionic bond. Okay, it's a bonding system. And the cool thing about these uh, teeth is that they compact uh, specifically in a way that they are not contacting any type of wax and they are already um, pre sandblasted. So the surface is ready just to apply the, the bonding agent and then uh, go and finalizing these type of dentures, okay? So we move from mill teeth and mill bases to these type of concepts. This is what we started using, and you can see that uh, when you mill this like a horseshoe, it doesn't gives you that individualization that you wanted. I would say that it's something that's still available and it's good and might be a, a low cost uh, or interim uh, nice solution, okay? But now we would like also to combine with the high quality of the Vita Vigo Bionic teeth. What I really like, um, independently of, of the method you, you prefer to work, is actually the quality of the intaglio surfaces with uh, digital dentures. Because as I said, the impression is mucostatic. When you're taking this with the intraoral scanner, there's no pressure on the tissue. We know that the tissue is resilient. So many times I want to make a very good impression with the impression materials and I'm pushing the tissue and I go with the final denture and I don't have the best internal fit. So this is something that we've seen is really good and really positive. So here we didn't like much the, uh, the aesthetics, right? But if the teeth are properly positioned, then uh, these dentures worked very, very well. And if these, these, teeth, uh, these two, this denture, I'm sorry, uh, fracture or the patient lost it, it's very easy to remake it, right? Because we have the data there, we can just print again, we can just mill again. And that's one of the biggest advantages of digital uh, dentures. And this is, um, I think, the, the one of the first cases we did with uh, Vita uh, Vionic. And uh, it's a very particular case with one of our uh, pros uh, residents. Uh, the patient came and uh, she wanted to do a full mouth rehabilitation and the student was uh, gonna get ready to take preliminary impressions. And of course, when you see this level of tooth mobility, a failing fixed dental prosthesis on the upper left side with an alginate impression, these, uh, uh, Prosthesis can come out, you can do the extraction unintentionally, right? And that's where I think that the intraoral scanners are extremely helpful. So here, what we do is that uh, we go ahead and start scanning, okay? So this is the um, CEREC Prime Scan, and this is the uh, preliminary impressions of the upper arch, okay? Um, we can see that there might be some discrepancies, discrepancies between the buccal scan and uh, the bite of the patient because this is totally mobile, right? So this is just an initial bite registration that we will use to design and fabricate um, interim prosthesis, right? We understand that with such a complex situation, our buccal scan is not perfect and we will then modify when we go for the final prosthesis. 
But um, if we go with the analog approach, it would be basically almost impossible because to take an impression of these teeth, uh, they might just uh, come out as I, as I was mentioning before, okay? So when you're doing the buccal scans, we can do in both sides, uh, left and right, or in this case, of course, more on the left and the anterior teeth, because that's where we have maxillomandibular um, relations. And this is where we started working with the uh, Vira Vigo bionic teeth. So this was designed in the um, three shape software, but as I said before, you can also implement this with the ExoCAD software. And uh, we have now two, two options. We can uh, 3D print the base, okay? This is a Lusiton uh, material, a uh, very common and used uh, material for many years in the analog workflow. And, uh, or we can still mill the base, okay? You can see here um, the, the 3D printed base. And what you're seeing here, it's basically the, um, negative side of the Vira Vigo tooth, okay? This tooth was modified, so it's slightly smaller, okay, in the cervical part, in the intaglio part, so we can have more material surrounding the tooth, okay? I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse here, but uh, you can see that uh, we can see the places where we're gonna locate the teeth, but we still have sufficient thickness which is very important for the long-term success before some of that digital denture teeth sets were too bulky and then we didn't have sufficient space for the base okay so this is how the teeth compact they are these are the vita bionic vigo digital tooth solution they uh come uh pre-packed as i said without contacting any any wax totally different than the traditionals. And then what we're going to do is just apply uh, the bonding agent and following the instructions, you can download the PDF on how to do this step-by-step -step from the Vita website, okay? And as I said, these ones are uh, pre-sandblasted um, on the intaglio um, surface, okay? So as well, I was trying to explain before, if you see the image here, the third, the third photo, it has a uh, reduced tooth dimension and it's already uh, sandblasted, okay? It's also undercut free on the basal design. So it's going to be um, easy to be able to replace the tooth where it was planned. So uh, we had to go through modifications or on their initial um, concept and this really simplify the whole whole workflow because we're just playing Lego, right? We're just printing or milling a base and then we're just putting the teeth while maintaining the high quality, the color stability, the texture, the detail that we still cannot achieve when we try to print or mill this from um, one single uh, material, okay? So I think, as I said before, this is the best of, of both worlds. Of course, the position of the tooth in harmony with the muscles, with the structures, it's still uh, I would say the most important aspect for these treatments to be successful, okay? So uh, these are um, options that you have, as I said before, to fabricate the, the dentures. Still, we need to do that uh, trying while we can uh, skip the uh, wax rim in some cases, or if you like to just follow more of an analog and digital workflow where you have to have the case articulated on the semi-adjustable articulator with wax rims, you can scan that and then you move forward with the milling of these uh, Vita Bionic wax uh, blanks for the trying. We can also mill or print the final base and have the bonding system and uh, be able to make these final restorations, okay? So uh, you can see here, even though this was an interim uh, prosthesis, we were very close on the uh, occlusion aspect, and then we're going to use this uh, Vita Vigo Bionic uh, prosthesis for the planning of the implants and continue. We can always uh, transform this one into the fixed provisional after the implants are placed. So I think it's worth it because the patient, this is a stage approach, the patient is going to be uh, wearing these uh, prosthesis for 
almost a year until we do the final uh, zirconia implant bridge in this situation, right? But um, this gives us a lot of information. All this planning is kept for the planning of the implants, okay? And now I would like to uh, transition to the edentulous patient's demands, right? And some of them, they are um, really looking to get back a fixed solution. So the hybrid dentures are, are very popular. They are treatments that require less time, less patients want them in less time. They want them in less surgeries and visits. Uh, some don't like uh, removable prosthesis, but all of them want to have excellent aesthetics and functioning. So what's my point here? My point here is that we have a demanding population as well, right? And it's not always that easy to, to meet the expectations that uh, patients have because they see all the marketing and they're exposed to all these commercial advertisements uh, everywhere they go. So uh, for many years when we were thinking about an all on X, one four, all and five, all and six, we had to uh, create a conventional denture and then we had to um, make the denture conversion protocol, right? Uh, where we had to make the holes in the denture and then capture the temporary abutments and then the occlusion was not ideal or the plane was scanted to her one side or the other. Um, but this is our most updated denture conversion protocol. First, we want to evaluate the initial stability of each implant. This part doesn't change. Every implant needs to be stable at 35 Newton per square centimeter. Once that has been uh, obtained, we can place the transmucosal abutments uh, or commonly um, known as multi-unit abutments. Why? Because this will transform that subgingival connection to a more equigingival that will just make easier the uh, prosthetic um, elaboration and always take x-rays to verify that these components are fully seating and then we can capture the titanium abutments on top of the uh, multi-units with auto polymerizing acrylic if the denture was milled from a PMMA acrylic but if the denture was 3D printed with resin material a bisacryl material is indicated to capture these titanium abutments, okay? So this is important to understand so we can have a proper, uh, let's say, bonding from the material that we use to capture these temporary abutments to the base of the material. So if it's milled from PMA, we want to use autopolymerizing acrylic. If it's 3D printed, the latest research shows that this acryl material will provide you a stronger uh, bonding to that base okay uh, always you can always place the healing abutments to avoid that the tissue starts to collapse on top of the uh, components while you trim and polish and, and remove the flanges and then deliver the provisional and very important always torque as indicated by the infant manufacturer don't be afraid of torquing because if you lose uh, you let a screw be loose there's going to be uncontrolled micro movements that could affect you during the process of the osseo integration. So if the implant is stable at 35, you torque it. If the, uh, the, the temporary cylinder needs to be torqued at 20, because you don't want to avoid this for loosening. Okay, this is a very classic article, but very important that shows the, the critical time Okay, so you see here down, we have the time in weeks and the percentage stability on the left and the day of insertion, the implants have 100% of primary stability, but that will start to go down as time passes. And uh, secondary stability, which is achieved by new bone, is gonna start to grow slowly around the fourth week. So when the patient has three weeks after the surgery, no more sutures, no more medications, no more swelling, that's where the patient actually needs to take more care, okay? And these are examples that we did uh, many years ago with the uh, Vita Fisiodens uh, teeth, with titanium frameworks and hybrid uh, prosthesis. So uh, these have been working great when we can obtain a passive fit. And I said before, nowadays, I would use uh, multi-unit abutments for every case all the time to simplify that passive um, fit. 
Okay, this is a, a, an upcoming publication that I did with Dr. Blatt on a case that I think we've discussed before, Jim. This is a, a, a full arch prosthesis, what we call like a new a new hybrid, right? We want to have that benefit of having a very lightweight uh, prosthesis on the full arch for the mandible because the mandible normally has a um, important reabsorption pattern that we will finish with a bigger framework and in severe cases these uh, prosthesis can be very tall and if you just go with full zirconia they can be very heavy for the muscles of mastication so uh, we can just uh, go with uh, all on X, in this case, five implants, uh, conventional impression with a 3D printed tray, okay? And then we can design this and mill this framework with a high performance polymer, okay? We like to use this because this is very light while still um, strong, okay? And then we will go ahead and design single units on top of this framework. Okay, this was done by uh, Jay Black in Orlando, and here uh, Jay designed the single crowns. These preparations are designed in the software, they are not uh, prepped uh, by hand. And then here we go ahead and mill the uh, Vita Enamic uh, single crowns. Okay, so we are having a hybrid ceramic on top, a high performance polymer as a framework, okay, and original titanium bases, non hexed to the implant connections, okay? We also have the VIA VMLC material, which stands for veneering material, light curing, that can be used uh, for both uh, complete dentures and for this type of uh, hybrid uh, prosthesis as well. So we like the possibility of doing extra oral cementation as much as we can, and then uh, go ahead and do the final delivery of the prosthesis in the patient's mouth, followed by the final cementation. Okay, so just as a reminder, if you're using V dynamic, a hybrid ceramic, this has uh, mostly a, a glass ceramic material there, 86%, so you need to use the hydrofluoric acid etching. If you're using the acrylic teeth, the Vita Vigo teeth, you're gonna aerobrade. If you're using zirconia, you're gonna aerobrade because there's no silica particles in those types of oxides. So um, we need to understand the proper surface treatment to all the different materials that we use nowadays for the uh, restoration of the edentulous patients. With uh, enamic, you need to use a silane coupling agent, okay, that will combine and provide you both uh, micromechanical retention through the hydrofluoric acid etching and chemical retention through the application of a silane coupling agent. In this case, we're using the ceramic primer plus that also has MDP there, so it's very helpful where when you want to bond this type of enamic. Uh, single crowns to zirconia frameworks, for example. Okay, so this is a five-year follow-up with a single unit enamics, very lightweight um, prosthesis, and it's something to consider when we want to do this type of fixed restorations in the lower arch. So uh, if we're working with the upper arch, we could use uh, zirconia, material that we like a lot. Uh, nowadays, we have many multiple options regarding the level of translucency, the level of, um, of flexural strength as well. And here, as I was saying before, the multi-unit abutments, even though the implants are not placed parallel, they make them look parallel because we have different levels of angulation, straight, 17 or um, 30 degrees. So the provisional is important to make sure that it's strong, that it has volume, uh, you're milling these from a, a PMMA disc. Make sure that your connectors are are broader than it will they will be for the final prosthesis. And then here we like to still sometimes take conventional impressions, mount this in the articulator, and then go ahead and design and mill the final zirconia restoration. And this is one of my favorite images because it shows the intaglio surface. Many times you see. Um, concave surfaces that are impossible for the patient to clean and we always need to consider that okay so just as a summary for bonding apc to titanium and zirconia air abrasion 
primer and the resin cement and that's how we create these type of full art zirconia restorations and now i would just like to uh quickly finish with a study that we just finished here in collaboration with uh perioprost department here at Penn Dental Medicine. As I explained before, the advancements in digital technology have increased the digitization of restorative workflows in implant dentistry. Uh, but we still need more evidence to compare full large 3D printed models from digital impressions and stone models fabricated from conventional impression techniques. Mm -hmm. Why? Because for many situations, we still need to have a master model. And when we're printing the models, when we are embedding the analogs, we are not always obtaining the precision that we need to have a passive fit. So here we wanted to see how these uh, latest generation of intraoral scanners are performing compared to conventional impression techniques and with the digital approach, how these new models with embedded analogs are performing compared to the type four stone models. So uh, our hypothesis was that digital impressions with these type of uh, snap-on scan bodies that we don't need to screw, we just place them by pressure inside the implant can be as uh, accurate as the conventional implant impressions. But we were still doubtful of the 3D printed models and see if that's actually as accurate as the gold standard. So we used uh, tapered internal implants with internal connections. They were placed in a model mandible and then we were able to scan all of these in the lab scanner okay here to facilitate the visualization and the measurements everything was kept 0.5 millimeters supra crystally these are the scan posts that are used for the digitization of the implant position we use a high resolution reference scanner in this case the inlab x5 and created a control group and then compared everything else to this the first group was the open tray as we've been doing for many years with um, pattern resin, splinting them, sectioning them, splinting them again, and creating these um, final impressions with PVS. That was group one, okay? And then we digitized this with the same scanner. Group two, we used a closed tray. We know this is not basically used much for full arches because it's not as accurate, but we wanted to check uh, also this technique with uh, stock trays and uh, PVS impression material for group two and then uh, for group three the intraoral scan which is what I'm trying to explain today and this is something that I'm very excited to show we use the direct prime scan from Densply Sirona with the latest uh, software um, version and here you can see that I'm having a linear scan pattern and this is how we should scan these type of uh, cases intraorally okay i'm going to go quickly through this but uh, we created group three by scanning those snap-on scan bodies on the same model mandible okay and then <clears throat> from that group we also created uh last group group four where we 3d printed with the uh, strategies object to 60 printer and these uh, models had the analogs embedded, okay? Because this is something I always was curious, are we able to create a model, 3D printed model, that is as close to the patient's mouth as we need to for materials like zirconia that won't give if we don't have that level of accuracy. So this is the control group, just using a lab scanner, group one, open trade technique with splinted, um, open tray impression copings group two with uh, closed tray impression uh, copings with uh, conventional impression group three just the data from the intraoral scanner and group four the 3d printed uh, models obtained from the intraoral scanner as group three okay so here we use different uh, softwares to measure and compare and just uh, quickly I would like to explain that what we use as a value to measure 
the accuracy of these different STL files is RMS. This stands for root mean square. So greater RMS value means that the objects are more discrepant. Okay, and these were the the final um, results obtained with a software for measuring this. It's called GeoMagic, and here we could see that uh, group three, which is the digital impression, is actually the most accurate, okay? And we can also see that group four, where we were creating these uh, 3D printed models from the digital impression are as accurate as the gold standard um, <clears throat> open tray splinted um, conventional impression technique so this for me is very exciting to see and it's a game changer and as i always comment with jim things that we said a years ago now we are maybe modifying what we're saying because we're finding newer stuff that it's something uh, really exciting for us so just as a conclusion i could tell today that digital impressions and use of 3d printed models may be an adequate replacement for conventional impression techniques and stone models in full large implant cases okay uh, 3d printed models from full large digital impressions using uh, scan bodies seem to be as accurate as stone models when fabricated with um, from conventional full art impression techniques. <clears throat> and also here I would like to mention that within the world of 3D printing there are huge differences, right? So here we were using um, a workflow that it's uh, standardized using the Stratasys 3D printer. Uh, everything was produced by Vulcan, which is linked with BioHorizons, and that's their uh, milling uh, center or production center. So we were basically validating that workflow, and the results were very promising. So where are we looking for now to move forward in our research and, and what we would like to be able to share with you soon, validating photogrammetry workflows Honestly, after seeing that with the prime scan, I can be very precise. I can scan the soft tissue. I can scan the scan posts. I really don't see uh, the validity of using a photogrammetry uh, system nowadays, where still the evidence is uh, very reduced, uh, mostly clinical cases. And actually, some of the in vitro studies actually show worse results. So uh, that's why also we've got to be cautious with everything we see. and. Uh, of course, trying to implement things as the literature support. So to finish, treatment options in a dentulous mandible, complete denture, well, I put an asterisk there, only if the patient has a lot of experience with lower dentures, and I think that I can create something better than what the patient has. But um, our gold standard for a removable mandibular prosthesis would be an overdenture with two implants not printed in the canine region, all on four, hybrid prosthesis works great four or five implants and then we can use of course the zirconia uh, for fixed prosthesis with six implants ideally in the maxilla complete dentures still work excellent and as i said before now with these type of digital impressions intraorally it's a real mucostatic impression so it's very um, very intimate uh, the intaglio fit that we obtain, whether the base is printed or milled. Over dentures, yes, we use them, but with four implants because the bone density here is less than in the mandible. When implants are not splinted together, um, they don't have the same success rates as where we splint them with a titanium framework, for example. So hybrid prosthesis in the upper arch, we prefer to have five or six implants. I understand that the all on four is um, clinically um, studied and proven for the upper arch, but I prefer to have more implants. And if it's a fixed prosthesis, a minimum of six for those type of maxillary prosthesis. So um, I want to be on time. It's uh, 1 p.m. exactly. So I would like to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. This is my email, this is my Instagram page where I only share uh, dentistry uh, concepts, cases, uh, articles, tips, and uh, that way we can keep in communication as well. And if there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Uh, thank you, Jim, once again for the invitation.
All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Caneo. That was a, a great presentation to give us kind of perspective of both the clinical and the laboratory concepts. Let's get to the questions. Uh, let's see what we have. So uh, one of our first questions is, uh, what are your thoughts on using the peak material instead of metal uh, for full arch, I assume, for dentures mm -hmm. and so forth? Okay. Any, any? Yeah, uh, I, I showed uh, one case, right, that lower uh, <clears throat> prosthesis, and uh, I've been following uh, this material in this type of prosthesis. Um, prosthetic designs for five years now and I think that as any other material if we uh, maintain the minimal thickness recommendations by the manufacturer they can work well the disadvantages that I see on this material is actually the layering uh, I see something similar Jim with what happens with layering on titanium that it's not so forgiving. So that's why I like to combine using the big framework, but with this design for single crowns. So everything that is in the functional aspect is not layered on top of the uh, big framework. For the gingival part, you can use the Vita VMLC, and it's something that you could even uh, repair intraorally if you need, or to remove and, and add some more if you see that there's certain reabsorption in one specific area. But understanding the best indication of the material, that's what I think gives us the clinical success on the medium and long term. Um, this is nothing that I'm looking for to become a solution of a monolithic material. But uh, with these type of combinations, I think it works well. Uh, we got to um, have clear um, the bonding uh, protocols, as I showed in that video, uh, to make sure that the bond strength is strong to the different interfaces, right? So, um, yeah, I think it's a, a valid option. Um, and nonetheless, it's one option, but still there are other options that are still uh, good options as well. All right. So we have another question. Uh, were the full arch digital impressions uh, made with different scanners, or were they all the same? Uh, are they? Did you, have you found any accuracy more than of one versus the other, or it's not okay. uh, relative? So for, for the for the research study, yeah, all yeah. the um, digital impressions were made with the uh, Cerec Prime Scan because. We don't want to investigate what is already investigated. There's multiple evidence showing that the Cerec Prime Scan is the best intraoral scanner nowadays. Um, and then uh, we want to use basically what other groups have investigated and move from there. So uh, yes, I wouldn't recommend to do this with a older generation of scanner. Or, or another system that you've seen that it's not performing well with other studies. So here we use PrimeScan, and uh, I would recommend this scanner for this type of full arches. Uh, if you want to use uh, other scanners for uh, quadrant dentistry, for um, <clears throat> fixed prosthesis with a shorter span, I think they work great as well. But for full arch and this study, everything was done with PrimeScan. So uh, there's still some controversy. This is kind of a follow-up question. Uh, the also today, when you take a scan of the edentulous ridges, um, do you find that you had to go back and re-impress, go take a a traditional impression in conjunction with just a scanning impression? Yeah, and Jim, that's a great question, and uh, I was always doubting doubting the same way until uh, I, I had the, the opportunity to go to the International Academy of Dental Research a few years ago in London to present a poster and, and Dr. Goodacre was actually giving a lecture on uh, digital dentures and intraoral scanning for a dentulous patients. And I remember having that question to myself and being hesitant and then uh, he started to explain that when we're doing a border molding approach is something um, about 
your personal feeling is not something exactly determined of how much movement, how much pressure do I create, right? It's something kind of getting that feeling. So once I heard that, I'm like, yes, I understand now. So what I do, I scan properly the, the more firm structures and I will uh, retract the chick, the lip, and scan that information and continue and move from there. And I see that because of the important support is given on the hard palate, on the ridge where the uh, information is totally mucostatic, what I only need to do is to create space for the muscle insertions on the periphery, but these digital dentures don't even have post them because we don't need post them because the information is pretty accurate. So I'm, uh, you know, always trying to follow uh, great mentors, for example, Dr. Goodacre in this situation. And once I hear this concept from someone so respected like him, I was like, well, I'm going to start giving it a try. And, and he's correct. It, it works as well in my hands, in the hands of our residents. But we need to start changing our paradigms in a way and, and, and being meticulous on what needs to be uh, captured properly, I would say. So uh, um, that's the nice thing of how, how we start, you know, uh, learning from each other and, and and evolving. Yeah, and I, I think you hit the key is you've got to take your time to develop to to work with the scanner and scan properly in the proper process and the methodology. So, um, kind of a, another follow up. Um, you mentioned post stamp. Do you do post stamps for your digital dentures or no? No, we don't, and that's something different from the uh, from the conventional or, or analog uh, workflow. Um, we, we have less variables that we do with the uh, conventional uh, analog workflows when, when we work with these uh, new technologies. So as I said, the first thing, this is an optical impression. So I'm not even touching the tissue, right? So uh, I don't need to have any other uh, features Actually, we've seen that creating that post um, actually affects the intaglio fit of of the printed or or mill denture. So it's something uh, we we've adapted and we we don't do it anymore. Okay. The, uh, another question here: uh, Can we make digital impressions for extremely resorbed cases? So for really yes. absorbed uh, ridges. It works well yeah. still. Yeah, it, it works. Uh, uh, are you going to have a perfect retentive prosthesis? Maybe not, right? If that's where the question is coming from. But yes, you can. You can scan uh, severely reabsorption, moderate resorption, no significant reabsorption. But in those tough cases, maybe you would need to try to look for other alternatives, whether there are short implants or over dentures to, to compensate for the, the let's say, that the difficulty you might be facing on, on the, the retention of your uh, complete denture. All right. Uh, you want to touch on the any research you may have done uh, about the long-term use of a digital denture uh, printed and or milled is 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 printed dentures good for the long term do you know yeah yeah so you know in 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 many ways we like to be conservative right in in in, in what we put to the patient's mouth so uh we have a material for example like lucitone that we've been using for many many years on different uh, modalities right and now we can have it as a printing uh, option. So that's what uh, we, we've been using. There's so many materials out there, Jim, that have very reduced uh, research behind them that I wouldn't just uh, start using everything out there on, on the patient's mouth. And, and there's many, many materials, uh, printing uh, options that we, we don't know and, and we don't uh, have the chance to, to, to review or, or test. But there are many that uh, have been used in other analog uh, methods and now they are adapted to the printing. I would say that that would be something that would make more sense for me to start incorporating uh, the, the materials. Um, let's say 
this year uh, we're gonna have the ITS in Germany or the winter meeting in Chicago. I use those options as well to start looking for new things that are coming up and, and at least start to be curious but not necessarily start using it uh, directly because we still have a lot of question marks. Yeah, okay. Uh, you showed a uh, slide there that had an articulator. Um, is there any particular question? Is, is there any particular articulator you like to use for denture fabrication? Is it? Yeah, that that, that was the uh, ExoCAD software, and you know the ExoCAD software is um, very versatile. You can you can do everything, and uh, um, I think it's a uh, very very good software and the articulation uh, parameters uh, there are also user friendly and you can uh, adapt to what you need to adapt. I think that it's more on the quality of the information that I'm putting into the software. That's more, more important than tweaking the values that the articulators have in the software. So I really trust the R&D of many of these companies. Those guys know a lot, work a lot. For me to just come there and start changing parameters, uh, I don't think I have a, a true uh, understanding of, of everything to just say, no, I've got to change this to this and that. My part as a clinician or someone that does lab work is make sure that what I capture is as, as, as clean as possible. As, as stable as possible the relation and then the software that's where they work pretty well but many times we start tweaking a lot more than necessary and that's a risk uh, um, and a reaction of not having the data collected properly i think that's something we, we should always uh, consider all right and then uh have you found an electronic device that will successfully uh, provide you with those average measurements, video, the vented angle, and so forth? Is, is there, have you looked at any good device that, that kind of morphs into the digital software for those measurements? Yeah, um, you know, that's something that we still do uh, analog. We still like to determine the vertical dimension at rest and 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 not only use those three millimeters like a rule but between two to four depending on what I see if I see that that's going to be a little bit too much then I go and reduce it that free space to two millimeters or maybe I want to have a more uh, important and significant change I might open uh, and consider having four millimeters instead of three um, but that part we still use it a uh, uh, analog uh, technology might be there uh, and it might be great but uh, I haven't had a proper experience or, or something to say you know what I'm going to change this yet but uh, maybe we catch up next year we'll be using something else right so uh, that's yeah. why uh, I like these these events as I was mentioning before where new stuff is launched and and, and many things are, are, are really things that will take over the way we work. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today with uh, Dr. Conejo. Um, uh, Julian, do you have any last parting uh, words you want to give to the uh, to the group, to the team? Yeah, no. Uh, I would say that as I started saying that the, the dentalist patient in the digital dentistry still has uh, some gray areas, but not don't let those gray areas stop you from implementing it and taking advantage of, of the benefits that it has. And I think that uh, there's uh, good standardized protocols and also each of us is going to use our experience in a way to modify those protocols to, to our best, uh, to obtain our best results. But uh, we got to get out of the comfort zone for sure and start implementing new, new, new options. All right. Uh, one last question just came in. So uh, your denture conversion protocol, is that yeah. is that online? Is it uh, something that's available for uh, someone can grab or that still well, development in development? No, no, no. Uh, it's it's um, it's it's very, very straightforward. Um, 
Jim, if you let me share one more time, I can put the slide and just review those four bullet points and the person can take a screenshot if, if they want. Important, the primary stability of the implants is not negotiable. If I'm placing six implants and one of them doesn't have a primary stability of 35 newtons per square centimeter, that one, I'm going to put a cover screw and let it sleep for a few months and I'm not uh, involving it in my uh, fixed provisional okay if the implants have this primary stability then i'm going to place the transmucosal abutments torque it at the um, manufacturer's recommendation and i like to take x-rays to make sure that i know that they are fully seated because if these are not fully seated there can be a slight micro movement and then that could affect the osseointegration integration of that implant the third point, we will place the uh, titanium abutments, uh, the provisional or temporary titanium abutments, and we will capture them with autopolymerizing acrylic if the prosthesis is meals. As you can see in the photo on the right side, this is uh, work from my friend Sean Han. If the provisional is milled, then you use autopolymerizing acrylic. But like in this one, this is 3D printed, I would use bisacryl material, the material that we use for the uh, direct provisionalization for ground and bridge, okay, that will have a better uh, bonding. I was reviewing these articles uh, uh, not long ago, and, and that's something uh, important to, to consider, okay? Then uh, when you capture the temporary abutments and remove the prosthesis from the patient's mouth, and you're going to trim the flanges or the polish, make sure that you put a uh, any type of uh, healing abutment on top of the multi-unit so the tissue is not collapsing. So you don't have problems and you don't hurt the patient when trying to deliver the provisional restoration later that day or the day after. And when you deliver the provisional, it's very important to torque as indicated. And of course, check the occlusion that you have uh, homogeneous centric contact points in both sides. And I would avoid having a strong um, contacts on the anteriors, on the excursive um, movements. And I think that uh, these five uh, um, concepts are, are important and will help you try to reduce the, the risk of uh, losing uh, any implant on immediate loading on full arches. All right. Okay. All right, well, Thank I appreciate you. that. Uh, and then uh, has facial scans um, play yeah. a role? in a complete denture. Yeah, um, I like to use the the, pho the photography, as I showed in the digital clone, I can share that that, that PDF if anyone wants, wants it and just contact me. Uh, but still the facial scans uh, are static in a way, so I don't think they are that beneficial. I hope that there's, there's a moment that we say, you know, I cannot work nowadays without a facial scan. Um, so we combine photography um, as a minimum, and it's very, very helpful. And you can use the facial scans as well. But um, hopefully they start to become more uh, beneficial for us in the near future. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Caneo, for spending the time uh, with uh, those that were have been interested in digital dentistry, digital dentures, knowing you know what the current information the current status is the accuracy and things you've provided everyone with a a lot of great information and we appreciate it thank you everyone for joining us just a reminder if you're looking for ce we are going to send you an email from our education marketing group that will ask you a few questions so that we can get ce for you so we'll need all your information to provide that We've got a lot of webinars going on uh, past year and for the next uh, half of this year. Uh, so please join us, look at those uh, recorded webinars. We've got a tremendous number of various uh, recordings. Uh, again, the social media, they're all posted there. If you need to get a hold of one of your local reps uh, from Vita, uh, please feel free to give, us, uh, give them a, a phone call or email them. Uh, this is a list of uh, both Canadian and the U.S. Uh, Vita North American reps that we can help you out. 
for uh, the rest of the remaining year. We've got uh, several programs still yet to come. We've got a couple even here with uh, with Dr. Canejo. So please feel uh, free to join us for future webinars. Uh, so September 2nd, the 22nd, we've got Dr. Canejo. November 16th, we got Dr. Canejo. So we kind of um, mix it up, right, Dr. Uh, Canejo? We kind of mix it up, dentures, uh, CAD CAM, uh, a lot of different various research that we know that you do at UPenn that we want to send out, give out to the uh, to the customer base. So, uh, greatly appreciate that. Uh, so please join us uh, for the future one. Is that you can get hold of us here at the uh, Vita North America uh, website, the help desk. Uh, please give us uh, an email or so. This is uh, Dr. Caneo's information again, if you hadn't uh, captured that yet. So we are going to uh, conclude uh, today's webinar. Uh, so thank you very much for attending. And we look forward to you to attend another in the future, another Vita Learning webinar. Thank you very much. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you as well.